Bruchem Aboyim. Welcome to our home. Um, tonight the uh, lecture will be on what I find to be a question. It's amazing how you can learn and learn and learn and still all of a sudden come up with questions that you never thought about. So the question, the topic this week on my thought is, did Yosef really forgive his brothers? So again, this week on my thoughts, I would like to examine this question. Did Yosef really forgive his brothers? I think that based on the wording found in the Torah, it's really not clear that he did. In fact, Rabbeinu Baha'i states that nowhere, nowhere in the Torah does it state that Yosef forgave his brothers, which is reason given by the sages as to why the Roman, pardon me, why the brothers were resurrected, again, as killed as the Asurim uh, uh, Rogi Malchus, the, the uh, martyrs, the ten martyrs that were killed by the Romans. Again, we read about them on uh, Yom Kippur in the liturgy. However, I think that we can learn many lessons about our family relationships, both positive and negative, by looking closer into this story. As a quick recap, uh, Yosef is hated by his brothers because he speaks slush and horror about them. He tells his father about all the supposed sins that he thinks that his brothers have transgressed. Again, what we call tail-bearing, lush and horror. To make matters even worse, his father Yaakovino gives Yosef a kasonis pasim, a coat of many colors, as a sign of his deep affection for him. The symbol of his affection only caused the brothers to hate Yosef even more. History up to this point in time recorded that only one brother in the family had ever been chosen. Hevel over Cain, Yitzchok over Yishmoel, Yaakov over Esau. The brothers saw his tail bearing about them as a way for him to take over the family and edge them out completely. His dreams indicated that he wanted to rule over them, which only reinforced their concerns. You know, this resulted in their inability as the Torah states in Vayesha, Velo yochlu dabru l'sholem. And they were, could not say peaceful words to him, which just compounded the problem and caused more hatred. He is sent by his father to Shechem to check out his brothers and the sheep. When he finds them, they strip him of his coat of many colors and they throw him into a pit with snakes and scorpions. They threaten to kill him, you know, but then they reconsider they decided rather than kill him that they would sell him as a slave to Egypt. <laughs> In Egypt, he is brought as he is bought, pardon me, as a slave by Potiphar, and he buys him for homosexual pleasures. He manages, Joseph manages to ma prove to his master that he was much more valuable as a overseer of his master's estate than being used as a sex toy. Under the circumstances, things basically were tolerable. But then he is falsely accused of raping his mistress, and then he is thrown into prison. From there, he is miraculously saved after he correctly interprets Paro's dreams. And on that very same day, he is elevated to the position of Viceroy of Egypt. Now, this whole story took 13 years to develop, which may well connect to the Yud Gimel Midas Arachamim, what we refer to as the 13 attributes of kindness with which God Almighty uses to administer to his chosen nation, Israel. The story continues, and just as Yosef had predicted, there's a worldwide famine, and the only place that has produce is Egypt. The brothers are forced to come down to Egypt to buy food. Yosef anticipates their arrival, and when they come down, he accuses them of being spies. He incarcerates them, but after three days, he releases all of them except for one. He sends the other nine brothers back home with instructions that they could not come back to Egypt to purchase food unless they would bring their youngest brother, their father's favorite child, with them to prove they were not spies. Well, with no other choice, they are forced to bring Binyamin down to Egypt so they can purchase food for the families. Binyamin is falsely accused of stealing Yosef's goblet. Yosef then takes him as a slave and tells the brothers, that they are free to go home. Yehuda presents an impassionate plea for his younger brother's release, and Yosef is forced to reveal himself to his brothers. Now, all the commentaries agree that the charade that Yosef played out with his brothers wasn't him taking revenge. It was for their spiritual benefit. It was his hope and prayer 
that it would be, he would be able to orchestrate a scenario that would act as a means of repentance for his brother selling him into slavery. The Shem Mishmuel states that if he had been able to draw out the deception just a little longer, it would have negated the necessity of the future of the death of Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah out of the house of Yosef, and also the final war of Gog and Amogog. Yosef had no choice but to end the charade, since Yehuda was now looking at Egypt as Shechem, and the brothers were preparing to destroy the city. You know, the verse in the portion of Mikhaid states, the Yakri Yosef is echoed, and that Yosef recognized his brothers. That when they came down to Egypt and he sees them for the first time, as Rashi says, interesting, his brotherly compassion is aroused. But then, in the very next verse, it states that he accuses them of being spies. He even has them thrown again into prison for three days. We know that Yosef was the only one of the ancestors that is given the title of Sadiq, the righteous one. That being the case, all that he orchestrated with the brothers was meant, again, for their spiritual benefit. However, we have to take into account that on his last encounter with the brothers, they had tried to kill him. So before he revealed himself to them, he first had to ascertain what their feelings towards him really were. Once he does reveal himself to his brothers, he says to them numerous times, Lo atem shal shichaltem, she locked him, excuse me, O si heina, which translates to mean it wasn't you who sent me here, ki halokim, but it was God. Based on that statement, one would believe that he had totally forgiven them. So, so to speak, all's well that ends well. However, it's possible that though he was a tzaddik, he was at the same time a human. We read in the portion that three times he refers to Avi, my father, and not Avinu, our father. With all the terror and trepidation that the brothers put Yosef through, one would think in his heart of hearts, could he truly forgive and forget what the brothers had subjected him to? The question everyone asks is why didn't Yosef contact his father, at least during the nine years when he served as the viceroy of Egypt? There are different answers to the question. One of the most logical answers is that he was well aware that his father was a great Sadiq and that he was closely connected to God Almighty. He may have reasoned that if God Almighty did not see fit to inform his father that he was in Egypt, then he felt that it was not his place to do so. But there's still another question that may have troubled Yosef. When he, in his capacity of viceroy, was questioning them, Rashi states that they told him that they had come to Egypt to find their long-lost brother, whom they thought was serving as a slave in Egypt. They told the viceroy that they were willing to spend a great deal of money to secure his release. Yosef then asked them, well, what if the owner of, this, of your brother refused to sell him at any price? They answered him, for this reason, we have come to kill or to be killed. Now, these words are very impressive, but think about it. If you're Yosef, aren't you wondering, why were all of you... Where were all of you for 22 years that I have been living supposedly as a slave in Egypt? Ruvain, the Torah states that you convinced the brothers not to kill me, but rather that they should throw me into a pit. Well, the next verse states that your plan was to save me from the brothers and to bring me back to my father. You intended to save me from a pit. Why not from a life of slavery in Egypt? And Yehuda, you're the king of the, the leader of the family. At the beginning of chapter... 38, Rashi states that the brothers removed you from your position of authority when they saw the grief of their father. They said to you, you said to sell him. Had you have said to return him home, guess what? We would have listened. Even after God takes the lives of your wife and your two children, you still don't think that maybe you should come down to Egypt and save the brother whom you so grievously injured. You know that nothing is an accident. Didn't you think that God was trying to tell you something? Somehow it never entered the minds of any of the brothers, even as they watched their elderly father suffer for 22 years, that they should have acted either as individuals or as a group, 
that they should have gone down to Egypt to save their brother, at least for the reason of putting an end to their father's grief. It was only after they were forced by God to travel down to Egypt to buy grain that they remembered Yosef, and then the whole scenario began to unfold. One also has to wonder as to why did why Yaakov did not go down to Egypt himself with Binyamin. It pained him greatly to be separated from his youngest child, the one who was all that remained from his beloved wife, Rahul. Now with a heavy heart, he sends Binyamin with Yehuda and he says in the verse, Kashir shacholti shacholti. If I must lose my children, then I will lose them. The question we have to ask is, if he was so certain that the mission was bound to fail, then why did he not go down to Egypt himself? After all, who would have been able to plead the case of the brothers not being spies better than a venerable elderly father? In addition, can you imagine the pain that Yaakov had to endure as he waited day after day for the brothers to hopefully return with both Binyamin and Shimon? It would have taken well over a month. But it seems to be human nature that when we have a choice of thinking good or bad, huh, more often than not, we choose to think about the bad. When they left, Yanko was dejected. There was little hope of changing his outlook and demeanor. Based on all this logic, he should have gone down to Egypt with his sons rather than wonder day after day what would be the outcome. Would they come back or not? Would Binyamin be safe? Would Shimon be released? Worry. But he did not think to go with them, nor did they think about going down to Egypt to save their indentured brother. But, but why? I believe that God has a master plan that he has programmed for his world. Though we are all created with free will, the world still operates within God's master plan for his creations. Think of it. How could Yaakov send his favorite 17-year-old son by himself to the war-torn area of Shechem to check on brothers whom Yaakov knew hated him. Yaakov must have spent the next 22 years of his life thinking that he must have been brain dead. So all of these scenarios, Yaakov sending Yosef to check on his brothers, the fact that none of the brothers thought of going down to Egypt to save Yosef during those 22 years, in addition to the fact the Yaakov did not think to accompany his favorite son Binyamin down to Egypt. All of these facts show us that there is a God in the world that orchestrates everything that occurs in his universe. Back to the question. So did Yosef truly forgive his brothers for their treachery? From the reading of the verses in the Torah, it's obvious that while their father Yaakov was alive, the family lived in peace and harmony together in Egypt. There were no issues. The proof of this is that the commentaries tell us that the best years of Yaakov's life were the 17 years that he spent together with Yosef in Egypt. 17 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word, tov, good. If his family had been embroiled in controversy and arguments in Egypt, well, then his last years could not have been seen as tov. As we know, nothing hurts a parent worse than seeing their children fighting with each other. So, as long as Yaakov was alive, harmony existed amongst the brothers. However, after they buried their father, the brothers were concerned that Yosef might still harbor some negative feelings towards them. They were concerned that now, with the death of their father, he might take revenge, since their father was no longer there to protect them. We read in the portion of Vayechi that the brothers sent a message to Yosef after the burial of their father. The message said that your father commanded before he died, saying, So shall you say to Yosef, I pray that you now forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin and for the evil that they did to you. And now, forgive, we pray, the transgression of your servants of the God of your father. This message, Rashi tells us, was a fabrication. It was not authored by Yaakov. Rashi states Yosef was not suspect Yosef was not suspect in his father's eyes. From the brother's message, we learn what it states in the Talmud Neovamas, that from here we learn that one can stretch the truth for peace. As I always say, better an insincere peace than a sincere war. 
In addition, Yaakov had already alluded to this request in the beginning of the portion of Ayachi. There he had requested that Yosef take an oath stating that he would bury his body together with his fathers in the cave of the Machpelah in Hebron. He asked that his son take an oath by placing his hand, Tachas Yerechi, under his thigh. This is an allusion to his circumcision, the only holy object that existed in the world at this time. The commentaries tell us that under his thigh, Tachas Yerechi, was also an allusion that Yaakov wanted an assurance from Yosef that he would continue to support all of Yaakov's offspring, even after his death. Now, why would they suspect him of taking revenge now? They had sold him some 39 years earlier. It seemed to connect to what Rashi comments in verse 15, that when their father was alive, they were accustomed to dine often at Yosef's home. But since their father died, they were no longer invited. I find it interesting that the brothers could have viewed this scenario of not being invited in two different ways. One, of course, as was just mentioned, that Yosef evidently still bore a grudge against his brothers, even after all these years had passed, so that his acts of kindness were not done as a form of benevolence towards his brothers, but they were done out of a sense of respect for his father, and so he did not act now. This is much like the scenario that occurred between Esau and Yaakov, after Yaakov took Esau's blessing. The commentary state there that Esau thought to himself that he would wait until his father Yitzchok would die, and then he would take revenge against Yaakov, his brother. Or they could have thought that it was just a natural phenomenon for families to splinter after their elderly parents pass on. After all, they, they then take on the roles of parents of their own families. This is also in addition to the fact that many times there just isn't enough space for everyone to attend. There is a law written in the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, where it states that if a son acquires high office, then he should move away from his father, so that neither of them should have the conflict of who should show honor to whom. Based on this thought, the Barashas Rabbah states that Yosef separated from his brother, brothers for proper reasons. While his father was alive, Yosef showed respect to his father. But now that his father was not in attendance, he had to acknowledge the fact that Ruvain was the firstborn, Yehuda was the king, and Yisachar was the Torah sage. This was in addition to the fact that he was younger than every one of his siblings, with the exception of Binyamin. They all deserved honor. And so, as to not show them any disrespect, he separated from them. So again, did Yosef completely forgive his brothers or not? We do read in the verse where it states that after the burial of their father, the Hebrew word avi, aviv, his father, is used twice, not avihem, their father. I do think that Yosef forgave them. But to believe that there existed no memory of his ordeal would really seem to be unrealistic. That is what the brothers felt in their hearts. The question was not whether Yosef could forgive them or not. The real question was whether they could forgive themselves. They, in their heart of hearts, thought that if they were Yosef, huh, they would not have been able to forgive them. So they placed their negativity on him. They could not appreciate just how righteous a person Yosef really was. Now this is the reason why the verse states, by Yef Yosef, the Bidabram Alav. And Yosef cried when they spoke to him. Imagine. He had done everything in his power to return good for evil. And yet they still suspected that one day he would take revenge, if not on them, then on their children. It is sad that all too often we place our negative traits on others and see them in the same negative light as we see ourselves. We should attempt to recognize the good in others, even if we cannot reach that level, as the states in Perkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Father, have a done is called Adam Lekav's that you should always judge all aspects of a person for merit. So, what do we learn from Yosef in his story? Though initially all of his tra travails could be viewed in a negative light, in reality, it was all of those travails that made him stronger, that made him grow. 
He could not have become Yosef HaTzadik without them. Today, we live in a time where many family members cannot even talk to each other and where sibling rivalry is much too prevalent. Statistically, over 33% of families today experience some form of division and animosity amongst their siblings. I believe that this is the true pandemic of the generation. Families have and will always have their issues. You know, it comes with years of history. In the, in the Hebrew language, the word for joy is simcha. These letters can be arranged to spell the Hebrew word shemacha, which is translated to mean to erase. The only way for a person, that a person can be truly happy in life, is if they can learn to forget. If you remember everything that you have experienced in life, well, it becomes very difficult to find and to retain any happiness. So let us learn from Yosef to always focus on the good. No matter what we experience externally, internally, we need to recognize that there is no such thing as bad. Now, bitter does exist, but it is the bitter that allows us to become much better. So just like Yosef, stay the course. Always keep God in your life. And you may be pleasantly surprised at what the end will bring. And with that belief, let us hope to usher in the coming of Shia Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending. God should bless you with health and happiness and safety, all that's good. Shabbat Shalom. And again, thank you for attending.